Um, okay, so now we're going to transition over to our second speaker. Uh, um, so here is uh, Mr. Mud Baron. He works with the LA Unified School District on a school gardening program. Uh, works with hundreds of kids. Uh, it's an incredible program, and uh, I'll let him do the rest. So uh, give a warm welcome to Mr. Mud Baron. So, yeah, I, uh, my name is Mud Barron, and uh, I take care of 886 schools worth of garden programs. So while Tara was talking about adults gardening, what I'm going to talk about is why kids need to be gardening. From the perspective, of course, we're at some environmental something class, whatever. You know, you signed up, it's an hour, two hours. How much time do we have? About 45 minutes? For me to talk? To, to talk and then we have discussion or we do half? Good. Okay. Thank you. Because um, I can talk. My nickname my students have given me is Discovery Channel. I'll try not to live up to it. Um, for those of you LA Unified, I saw one, two, and there's one over there. What school? I went to elementary school. You went to elementary school and then you escaped. Okay. And you? Which one? High school, yeah. So I went to Cleveland. No garden there. No. Couldn't have that. We need asphalt. What school? L.A. High, Diana Rabinowitz, science teacher. Were you in her class gardening? No? Exactly. Okay. So there's three <laughs> folks who have no experience at all with what I do. And what I do is basically create the engine, and using that term quite literally, for empathy of the natural world. Now, on the way in, I talked to my students, uh, fifth period on the way over. I was uh, fashionably late, like always picking these up, and I said, all right, guys, uh, you probably won't make it to UCLA, evidently, um, but your flowers and your questions will. I'm, I'm being candid. Uh, <laughs> look, you know, three of you from at local schools, the rest not, so I stand pretty much arrogant and right all at the same time. Um, so I asked them, what do you guys want, to want the UCLA kids to know? And like, why is gardening important? One kid said, plants. I'm like, okay, thanks for that informative discussion. <laughs> uh, another student said, you know, growing. I'm like, great, you know, growing. Now you, I've related that. And the one thing that was the, the little, the, 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 the proverbial uh, catchphrase, spiders. And that's the, the root of why school gardening is important. I deal with city kids for the most part at their elementary, their middle school. They've lived urban existences, from apartment building to parking lot, parking lot to school. The school looks like a parking lot. They go in, there's no contact with this thing. They call it nature, right? The natural world. Why would anyone be empathetic with something they're complete, that's a completely foreign concept to them? It's, it's Discovery Channel, it's Animal Planet. It's not their daily life. So today, this morning, when the kids were moving um, some stuff, uh, as, so, as Tara so eloquently put it, I believe the phrase is um, There were spiders, and they were wigging out. And that whole foreign concept of another species in their existence being something spiders, um, it's, it's a pretty profound uh, reflection on why should people care about the environment if they don't know what it is. You know, the word green is just that. For the most part, it's a marketing term at this point. Uh, really, when it comes down to it, if you don't know what the natural world is, I don't really expect people to have a deep appreciation for it. Um, I'm not your teacher, but I can ask this question. How many of you uh, actually took this class because you might, as my grandma would say, give a rat's ass? Anyone? Right? Okay. You get to live here a lot longer than I am. I'm 40. I just made it last week to that uh, milestone. Um, I'll be dead sooner than you will, and you'll have a lot more problems to deal with. And that's not just hyperbole, unfortunately. At this point, it was. 20 years ago when I was in your seats as the would-be environmental troublemaker. The world we live in is constantly evolving, climate shift, all this stuff, and it's very scary and complicated, but on a very small level, a kid and a sunflower is the interaction of human being and the natural world. Um, I, one of the times I was in this neighborhood up Sunset uh, a couple months ago, I was picking up roses. Uh, which may not seem like the most environmental thing of all things to do, but one of my nonprofits that I work with, the Garden School Foundation, based out of 24th Street, they just had a really great piece in Edible, LA. You can go online and see the kids making ravioli with Chef Gino with rosemary that they picked at their inner city uh, school garden. Um, inner city school garden, by the way. Um, 
the, the, the chef, the, 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 the roses were being donated because the guy was all enamored with the whole idea of growing his own food, right? And his name was Mr. King. And all the years I watched either Wheel of Fortune or Oprah, I'll admit it, I do. Uh, I have a Dr. Phil uh, obsession. Um, I never knew there was a Mr. King of King World. Well, there is. He lives up down the street. And he wanted to just get rid of these roses, and he wanted to put his vegetable garden in. So I'm not going to let the roses go to waste. You all know about the South Central Farm. You've seen maybe the movie The Garden. You can, you know, blockbuster. Well, this elementary school that wanted the roses, 30 miles inland, south of uh, a school with red and yellow colors, um, the principal had written me a really compelling letter. She says, Mud, please come help. Please help. My school looks like the surface of the moon. So that's code for asphalt, chain link, uh, super ghetto. So I pick up the roses, drive them all the way over from Mr. King's house, and drop them off. And I had contacted one of my many partners, which is a group called um, Million Trees LA, which they have contract partners like Tree People. You know about Tree People. Andy Lipkis, as a matter of fact, was the one who invited me to come talk to you guys. Um, they were going to be doing a tree planting, but we were also going to do a little beautification. Because while it may not seem like the most uh, aesthetically pure thing to do in terms of an, an eco-consciousness, you know what, the natural world is just that. And dealing with other species on this planet is one of the lessons that we as would-be environmentalists need to learn. So as I'm unloading the roses, and that's a nasty business, I'm bleeding right here and I'm bleeding all over the place. Um, I turn around and the kids echo the statement that my students at North Hollywood High School had told me. They said, spider! And I look around, and it's these 10-year-olds, these fifth graders, and they had seen a spider in the rose bushes. And when I turn around the second time, they were stomping it, like they were jumping it into some gang, like you know, some weird <laughs> episode of Cops. Because they didn't know how to deal. They couldn't cope. They couldn't manage. It was just completely foreign. Their experience, a spider, that's a horrible thing. And when we talk about the actual business of the ecology and the sustainability, a spider plays what role in a garden? Pest controls. The spider is those lovely toxic chemicals that were so popular 30 years ago. That spider is going to eat many times its own weight in all sorts of pests that are going to bug your plants. But, you know, for 10-year-olds in South LA, a couple blocks away from the South Central Farm, it's this threat for my kids who grow these flowers. Pretty kind of looking, huh? Right? Um, it's, it's, it's this foreign invader. And, and the point being, there's four reasons why school gardens are important. And the first one, because context is everything, school gardens are the engine of environmental empathy. It's that starting spot. That's why they're important. Um, environmental education, for those of you, any education majors here would be teachers. I don't blame you if there aren't any. Um, for, for environmental education, gardening being part of that and outdoor education, 76% of all kids that perform in environmental education programs, experiential, gardening, whatever, they do better on their test scores, they do better uh, in the, on their GPAs. It's just it's what it is. Um, you guys are probably okay smart being you're all at UCLA, but you know, that remains to be seen. Um, the second reason, and, and Tara talked about it as well, why school gardens are important, it builds community. Um, I've got, I got a call from someone who wanted help from me. Uh, I'll, I'll, at root, I'm a fundraiser for garden programs. That's my job. But uh, he's in East LA, unincorporated East LA. Uh, Dwayne Sherman, he's the toddler whisperer. Uh, he's amazing. He needs, he needs help. But glad to give it to him. But he routinely brags about his four-year-olds. I mean, as far as the environment goes, back to number one, Four-year-olds from East L.A. and sunflowers is charismatic megafauna if there ever was any. And those are his kids, and he talks about how they have the greatest socialization skills when they make it to kindergarten because they've learned how to problem solve at age four. They've learned how to figure out how to keep Mr. Fluffy, their terrorist bunny that eats all their broccoli, at bay as a group. And you know what? They count and eat carrots, and if there's 10 carrots and 20 kids, there's a little bit of fight at first, but they figure out how to work it out. Um, building community, another neighborhood in East LA, Boyle Heights, when they have school garden work days, the same as the school garden work days that happen at Venice High School, which is in Venice, or Carthay Center, which is at La Cienega and Olympic, 100, 500, 1,000 people show up. Because one of the things that is the price of entry of a garden, it doesn't matter if you are a student loan, uh, stu you're, you're in student loans up to your eyeballs, right? right? 
Um, you have uh, no real experience. You don't know what you're doing. All you know how to do is put food in your mouth. You don't know where the food comes from. But you have time and you have enthusiasm. You, as a parent at a Title I school, do you all know what Title I schools are? That's code for free lunch. 75% uh, of all LA Unified kids are on free and reduced lunch programs, which is actually part of USDA, which is an ag program. That said, communities come together around building gardens at schools. Um, and it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for any of you guys to engage also, and I, at the end of this, we'll talk about opportunities for you to be um, mentors to my high school kids who, you know, they may look like you, but they don't know that they can actually go to UCLA because, you know, they're only 20 miles away. But for most of them, they think Valley College is the best they can do, and I know better. Um, let's see, what's the other reason why school gardens are important? I said, I said uh, environment, community. Oh, yeah, deepening academics. I guess I should have paid attention to that more. Academics um, basically drive all things about school gardens. It's absolutely, absolutely um, vital that education be experiential. For that matter, everyone stand up. Just get up, get up, get up. All right. Um, this is going to be my uh, uh, Anabaptist roots coming through. Uh, turn to the person to one side and pull their finger, and the other person make a farting noise. <laughs> Are you really doing it? Are you really? Cool. Performance art. Nice. All right. You can sit back down. You're, 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 you're there. I brought plenty of basil. We can't smell anybody. Good. Okay. You know, um, see, now you'll remember, you won't remember anything, but he had me pull fingers. What's going on? Um, yes, they do call me Discovery Channel, although I dip into Comedy Central every now and then. Um, you know, how we learn is uh, a curious thing. There's different studies that have done about how we actually accumulate and execute knowledge. What gardening does is it's called project-based learning. And these flowers were the test. Now dial back from them. How do we take the steps with horticulture, botany, science, chemistry to get to this point? And then the actual flower arranging becomes art, and you have all these subjects woven together. Oh, those kids are just gardening. No, there's a million things going on here. Um, we had an LA Times uh, reporter come out to our garden at North Hollywood High School. There's a great video online. You can send out the link. Um, you know, there's a kid with a mohawk, piercings. He looks like a, a, a guitar tech for a really bad, uh, you know, knockoff of Maroon 5. Sorry about the shirt. Um, and, you know, he, he's telling the, the LA Times reporter that, oh, yeah, if we trim the terminal ends, we end up with lateral flower development. You know, but he's, you know, a 17-year-old with piercings and a mohawk. Um, he also makes a mean bouquet, and I've kept him out of the army, so I feel particularly proud of that. Um, and the last thing, the last of the four reasons, remember, recap, and the environment, whatever. Yeah, community, whatever, uh, academics, whatever. Uh, this is a panel about food. So the, the last reason, it's not just food itself, but it's all about healthy choices. Um, within Los Angeles proper, of which my school district has 700,000 kids. A lot of you came from places that didn't have 700,000 people. I have 700,000 kids that are dependent upon me, me, to get them the plants, tools, uh, irrigation, and soil to have garden programs. A little bit of pressure that. But 30% of those kids suffer from early onset diabetes. They suffer from 20% are, are early onset morbidly obese. Um, physical inactivity is limited to PE with the current budget cuts. If they had two PE classes, now they're down to one which for those, many of you, right, uh, may have been humiliating events that you could have done without, but more or less moving around is a good thing. And if you don't want to play dodgeball, well, you know, gardening is an opportunity to be pretty active. I'm not uh, looking like a gardener. I actually am one. Um, this is my last opportunity, day of freedom, before I have to put a suit on next week and take on my new job as the green policy director for the school district. But today, I get to be a gardener. Um, you standing up, you pulling each other's fingers, that little, did you, and you enjoyed that, right? right? <laughs> you admit it. I mean, it was a little bit of a, you know, oh, look what Uncle Mud's making me do, pull fingers on a mass level. But um, that little bit of physical activity, re 
setting your state, getting you guys back together, is going to make it possible for me to actually communicate with you actually listening for the next 20 minutes, which is not a bad idea. I'm getting kids who may have, um, any of you guys want to volunteer that you have emotional issues? Guys, let the girls know now. Come on. Anyone? No? All right. Um, letting kids who have severe emotional disturbance issues get out and take their aggressions out on a compost pile is something that Tara would love, right? Um, having kids that uh, have all this energy, you know, uh, they have this thing at 1030 in the morning called nutrition. Now, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> you're laughing. It, it's, it's basically a glorified uh, ghetto Pop-Tart and some sugar water juice, right? That's what nutrition passes for. And then you're the teacher who has to deal with this little banshee from hell who's <laughs> sugared up to Kellogg's delight, okay? <laughs> So, you know, having a place to creatively, physically work off that uh, tension, that frustration. Um, and the garden that this came from, you're, any of you are welcome to come visit one Saturday. Um, this is a seven acre farm that this comes off of. So the kids kind of forget that they're in the middle of urban hell and they have a moment to uh, chill. All right, so that said, um, any questions so far? Why school gardens are important. Which school are they from? This came from North Hollywood High School. And I guess we could ask why did he bring flowers? Oh, mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Go ahead. So when you get to the school, mm -hmm. um, I can't imagine like if in, if you're in the city, there's not that much space. So you like basically pop up with mm -hmm. Okay. Like well, I just told you there is that much space. Uh, an acre is a football field. So. There's a seven acre farm over at North Hollywood High School. Venice has an acre and a half. Marina Del Rio Middle School has an acre. Silmar has two acres. Canoga Park has one. At the, the school district is the third largest landholder within the city of LA. Uh, nearby here, there's a two acre garden at Uni High School, which is the little nearby high school. Um, they don't have an inspired teacher, unfortunately, so the, the space looks like a Bermuda farm, which is okay. You know, it's open space. That is a good thing. Um, more to your point of your question, she had asked about, well, there's not a lot of space at a lot of the schools. What do you do to break the concrete open? Um, yes, yes, there's a great nonprofit called Depave. I said Depave, but actually it's Depave.org. And their work is pretty inspiring. Asphalt bad, dirt good. I think that's the, the message of sustainable agriculture. Um, anyone love asphalt? Anyone? Because I've got a bunch of it you can have. Um, there are interesting uh, ways that people go up. Uh, the city of LA's Environmental Affairs Department, by the way, on the opposite end of Terra's spectrum, donated $40,000 worth of recycled plastic lumber. It's uh, uh, biologically, chemically inert. It doesn't splinter. It's the same stuff, the Trex decking, but we just stand it up on its end. We repurpose it, and we make raised beds. Unfortunately, most of those gardens are so small that the plants the planter boxes have become these plant coffins. I'm missing a whole generation of garden teachers. Um, LA Unified used to have, was that me? LA Unified used to have 80 ag teachers with two and nine acre holdings. Now I'm down to just three. And I lost my UC Davis uh, graduate who was 23, Karina Ramirez. Uh, the budget cuts gave her a pink slip. Uh, and she went back to the Bay Area where she's working as a sub Spanish teacher even though she's got a degree from UC Davis with student loans, loans to prove it. Um, it it's, it's sad, but at the same time, there's this resurgence. There happens to be this one black lady I like a lot. Her name's Michelle, and she wears $600 shoes, and she has a garden in her house. Anyone, anyone have an idea who I'm talking about? There we go. Very good. All right. Man, you guys, UCLA folks. When I spoke at USC last, last year, they didn't get that question. So, yeah, um, you guys are good. Um, yeah, Michelle Obama has done this thing. She put a garden on her lawn. And, you know, regardless of whether health care happens or not, regardless of climate change happens or not, me, the sustainable ag guy, loves her broccoli. Love it. Love it, love it, love it. And she's doing it because of, it's about healthy choices. It, it adds all those other things, but if you ask her, it's all about her kids being given a really positive opportunity to do something that is going to inform their lifelong nutrition choices. It's, you know, the, the organic folks see it one way, the sustainable farming folks see it another way, but on her end, it's all about the kids and having good eating habits. Um, that said, she'll drop $55 on a salad at Chez Panisse as well. 
Um, other questions so far before I get on to this? Cool. Go ahead. Um, if you are an asphalt recycler, you certainly can, and they do. It's, it's all turned back into roads again. Um, one of the problems with tearing up asphalt at school sites, and, and the Obamas dealt with this a little bit, um, in the 90s, the Clinton administration was a little bit too cozy with the sludge recyclers, and that's a much longer topic, and it's something that's worth exploring on your own. But basically, when you tear up asphalt, all the stuff that's in that soil is still there. So one of the reasons why we go up is to just bypass the issue entirely. And we throw mulch on top of the asphalt so it doesn't look like asphalt. Uh, a big issue that the school district is out of compliance with is uh, something called a heat island. You all know what I'm talking about? A lot of asphalt, a lot of black, heats up, especially in a city. You guys are a little bit coastal. These are grown in North Hollywood, which is 20 degrees warmer generally than what you guys are. There's a reason why on Entourage they bag on people in the valley. Um, the Dahlias like it though. So th that said, um, heat islands are something that the school district is wildly, wildly, flagrantly, uh, it, it, it rejects. Have any of you guys seen a local elementary school? Most of them look like little jails with galvanized steel and asphalt and little prison bungalows. And unfortunately, that sets a common expectation of the lowest common denominator aesthetically. Uh, Spencer was telling me that uh, Mr. Obama, when he came here, he says, oh, this place is, is landscaped too well. You should spend more money on, on books and, and, and education and not really you know, give everyone the country club experience. Well, I actually think the country club is experience is something that people in East LA need to have too, because if they're ever going to go beyond what's expected of them, 90% of my graduates end up making $2 more than minimum wage 10 years after they graduate. You've got to broaden their experience of what as a business is possible. Um, on the business end, how much more time do I have? Okay, wow. Um, two, two projects. We're going to start the experiential part of this class. Um, let's see. You guys are willing to pull each other's finger. Let's see what else you're willing to do. Um, who wants some of these flowers? Okay, cool. All right, you come down, you come down, you come down, it's closer. And the guy in the back, there we go. Um, one of my students said this. He goes, you know what, when I was arranging flowers, a lot of my friends would call me gay. But the moment I gave flowers to my best friend's girlfriend, everyone stopped talking about that and asked me if they could have flowers too. <laughs> and, you know, from my own personal experience, I'm, I'm half Martha Stewart and half John Muir. I mean, I'm, I'm working both ends. All right, so here's the thing. We're going we're gonna to do a little bit of a flower arranging class, a little bit. Now, for the rest of you who want to give flowers, here's the thing. You're going to get flowers to take with you, but you have to give them away. And you have to take a picture, and tomorrow we'll put it on my Twitter feed, and we'll, we'll see what, what happens. Because I gave flowers to Isis and the crew, and they were just like, oh my god, we're broke college students, thank you so much, right? <laughs> and the boyfriends got a little jealous, and they stepped up their game a little bit. See, everybody wins. Okay. All right. So. Why are we doing this? Well, the appreciation of the natural world is something that's just that. And historically, within the scope of environmentalism, the aesthetic environmentalists, the conservation, whatever they are called, those guys, who, the old white guys from the Sierra Club that were walking around the mountains, right? Okay. Their thing was to look at the beauty of the natural world, preserve it, don't touch it, whatever. I've always been a strange fit. I came here in 1993. I was a producer at the old Lollapalooza Festival. Um, I was on loan from an environmental group. I came here to Los Angeles because I thought that Hollywood, unlike my peers who thought Washington, D.C. was the case, I thought Hollywood had more power over the way people see the world than anything else. You can argue Washington, Hollywood, whatever, but they're both centers of power. So it was my first job as a producer at Lollapalooza to work with charity groups and nonprofits, and we did Oprah Palooza and the poetry thing and the verbal circus sideshow and all that stuff. And point being is, you sure Hollywood has a lot of power. It does. But unfortunately, it's mostly Nicole Richie on People Magazine talking about her drug habit, which I find fascinating personally, but <laughs> not exactly going to be you know, socially redeeming. On the other hand, now Miss Maroon 5 t-shirt over there uh, is, is redeeming because it really gets vapid from here in this conversation. I was looking on my Twitter feed. I love Twitter. How many people do Twitter? If you want to follow me, my name, 
you could just use my name because that's understandable. It's Mud Baron, and I'm going to get to you guys in a minute. Uh, my Twitter name is Kokuzochi, which, like, what the f***? It's <laughs> the Aztec name for Dahlia. Because some of you are saying, oh, those are not California-friendly, water-wise, zero-escape plants. Well, if you define California broadly, okay, this is the national flower of Mexico, and here we are. So there we go. You're laughing. You're having a Latino moment. I like that. <laughs> All right. So, so anyway, so I'm, I'm working and talking here. It's a big thing that we do. Um, when I, be, before I worked at Lollapalooza, I was a farmhand, Pennsylvania Dutch, 150 acre, and I was a migrant picker, and I did all that stuff. So me working for San, San Francisco and Los Angeles environmentalists was always a really strange fit. And now I seem to have found my niche, being a farmer in the middle of the city with city kids who are trying to get at their best friend's girlfriends. Um, now, why flowers are important. Are you guys watching, by the way? I wanted you to come up so you could like look better and uh, everyone can uh, humiliate you later when you make really crappy bouquets. Um, why flowers? Why is this interesting as human beings? Okay? And this is my own take on it. My hobby is giving flowers away. If you follow my Twitter feed, it's like all that guy does is just go around giving flowers to people like Eric Garcetti, who, by the way, is the biggest flower for ever, <laughs> ever, ever. For years, I would give flowers, and he would say he'd take them home to his, his now wife. No, they were for him. He's, he's there. Um, and why specifically um, women like flowers? This is, this is human evolution. This is, this is me working on the side of what you guys are all programmed to do. For hundreds of thousands of years, you know, our ancestors roamed around and ate stuff they found. Flowers pretty much show up before the food shows up. And so... Our ancestors, the ones that reproduced, right? Because we're all here, more or less. Um, Spencer's from a test tube, but I wasn't supposed to talk about that. <laughs> sorry, sorry. This is a big old billboard for food is here. And so within the nesting context, women, more or less, and I, I'm stereotyping, but my experience tells me otherwise. There's three and him. <laughs> and are the flowers for you, or is there a girlfriend involved? You just want some flowers, all right. <laughs> Basically, this, this, this is life. And so the human beings that figure that out, they pass down their genes. Let me ask you a question, because I just gave you the answer. Why do plants exist? This is the gardener's mantra. Why do plants exist? Anyone have an idea? It's an environmental class. I know what I'm going to hear. Come on, tell me. Speak out loud. You guys can talk, too. Why do plants exist? To make carbon, okay, that's why, they, that's, they do do that, thankfully. What? To give life to, give life to whom? Okay, so basically, I had a kid so my neighbor could eat him. No. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't, not, not so much. Close, but horrible, tragic entertainment tonight story there. Okay, what, why, why do plants exist, guys? To reproduce. To reproduce themselves, there we go. So the, the kid up front had to ruin it for all the rest of you or you struggle. Yeah, plants exist to make more plants. It is the Darwinian sort of evolutionary thing. F plants that figured out how to pass their genes along. Flowers are a pretty good way to do that. If you want someone to reproduce you, look like that. Um, I, I don't know how I had a kid look at me, but, you know, whatever. Um, plants exist to make other plants. That said, as gardeners, we dial that in. We exploit that tendency, right, Tara? We exploit that all the time. That general, you don't, you're, you're disagreeing or you're going like this? Plants exist to make more plants. Yes. There we go, see? <laughs> you use that and you end up with more flowers. One of my students who's at UC Irvine this fall, she just started, freshman, um, she's like, you had me deadhead all those flowers on, on Tuesday and by Friday they were blooming again. I go, yeah, pretty much you killed their children and they wanted to go make more. So that's the general thing that we go with. And one of the things that's really ridiculous about the whole talk of the recession and what's really ridiculous about the whole economic gloom, you do have to realize that we live in an artificial economy, that the vagaries of Wall Street are just that. They're based on artificial constructs of what wealth is. Sorry, it is. I've never, eat a stock, I've never ate, eaten a stock report in my life. The real wealth of what our country is built upon is the ability of this nuclear power plant to fuel 
the life cycle of plants, which enables us to eat all day long, pretty much, you know, to the point of obesity. All of you guys ate today? You, you realize that's like nuclear power generated solar energy translated into food? And as far as I know, that's still working, right? Okay, so that said, let me pick you up because you're all going to cook. <laughs> um, all right, so this is a basic bouquet, right? Is that good enough for you? Okay, what do you like about it? Uh, I like that it has a lot of varieties of species in it. Right. Wow. I'm, I have to come to UCLA to have someone say, I like the variety of species in your book. <laughs> okay. It's okay. I'm going to call you Species. That's your nickname. All right. What do you like about this one? I like the colors. You like the colors. No. The color. Yeah, it does smell. That's not me. That's the, yeah. yeah, exactly. Okay. And what do you like about this one? Simple, yeah. Simple. I get that a lot. Well, the fact that it, the green accentuates the flowers. Right, okay. And you? You just wanted flowers. I got it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, so, so this, this is a little bit beyond the rule of three, but it's pretty much got that. It's got the dahlias, the star of the show here. It's got the rosemary in the background. That's rosemary, California friendly, Mediterranean plant. Uh, if you want to know how bad school lunch is in LA Unified, this is a true story. I was meeting with my development team over at Carthay Center Elementary. Amazing program. And um, I brought a sprig of rosemary and a dahlia into the kitchen when I had to go pick up some coffee for the, the meeting. And so the woman with the hairnet, yes, the lunch lady, uh, who was warming up some burrito thing. I go, these are for you, here. And she goes, ooh, what's that? And she meant the rosemary. So. Yeah, exactly. The rosemary is nice. And then Thai basil. Okay, so there's your green stuff. And then the dahlias, star of the show. And there's a little bit of amaranth in here, which in some ways, do you have this like a weed at your place too? Yeah, yeah it's great. It's, it's amazing. I mean, a weed is what, anyone know the technical definition of what a weed is? Not weed, a weed. <laughs> we already went through that. Anyone have an idea what a definition of a weed is? An unwanted plant, right. It's sort of like my ex-girlfriends, but different. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, they teach here. I have to be careful. All right. Um, so this is something that you guys can do. I got rubber bands. And I'm going to see how you guys make. While I'm talking a little bit more, you guys are going to make some bouquets. So I, I didn't follow my own advice very well. Um, one dahlia, uh, some of the amaranth, or some of the other greens, and something that smells good. Okay, and I have a pair of pruners, but you guys don't need them because these are kind of short anyway. But if you do need them, can, who can be trusted with scissors? <coughs> Not him, her. There we go. Okay. Um, and the other uh, aspect, something that you guys probably need to learn. How many of you guys are strongly suggest, strongly leaning towards a career within the environmental field? Okay. All right. That's a lot of hands. I don't know how much recycling can money you guys are going to get to pay for your jobs, but maybe we can work on that. All right, so you had your hand up. What do you want to do? Go ahead, you then. I just embarrassed someone, so go ahead, your turn. I have no idea. You don't know? Okay. All right, so you, what year? Third. Your third year. Wow, you better have an idea soon. All right, um, <laughs> what's your major? Environmental, Environmental studies. studies. Okay. English minor. With an English minor. <laughs> so you can be an underpaid teacher one day. Nice. <laughs> You can write magazine articles. Have you been writing magazine articles? You, you, okay, well, here's, here's a valuable lesson. Um, you know, right now, someone else is paying all the bills, more or less, more or less. I mean, I don't know. You could have 10 jobs. I don't know. But um, yeah, fail quite a bit. Get a lot of rejection. Go out there and do embarrassing things now. Uh, there's no actual cost involved other than the experience of it. Um, my first job working in California, I came out from the Midwest. Uh, farm kid, was working for this guy named David Brower. Any of you guys know who I'm talking about? I was hoping no one would say. One person, and he looks like, yeah, exactly. So who was David Brower? Oh, he's the guy that gives my Izzy, nice. That's a good reason to know somebody, right? Okay, yes. He is, a, he is dead, so that's, that's true. <laughs> anyone else have an idea who David Brower is? Wow, this is going to be a bonus for you guys. David Brower is the founder of the modern American environmental movement. He started uh, League of Conservation Voters, Friends of the Earth, he took the Sierra Club from a little group of 500 old white guys in San Francisco to, what, 500,000 members. Um, any of you guys read a coffee table book before, like on cars or kitty cats or something? OK. This is, this is the crazy thing about, about not knowing who David Brower was. Really great, my first boss, mentor. Anyway, Dave um, 
decided with his buddy Ansel Adams, more hands going up, Ansel Adams? Okay, there we go. Dave was Ansel's publisher. So they thought if people saw the Sierras, they'd want to save them. Very crazy idea. If kids don't know what spiders are, why do they care? If uh, people don't know what gardening is, why should they care? So what Dave was able to do with Ansel is figure out something that in the long run is probably used more trees than any other single crass type of publishing, but the lowleaf coffee table book exhibit format in publisher speak was started by the Sierra Club and it was pictures of the Sierras, which people been to the Sierras, right? Okay. Oh my God. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Who's been to the Sierras? All right. Now the rest of you, whether you're from overseas, you're from Nebraska, that's sort of like, I don't, I'm, what, what would be the metaphor? Uh, going to the Japanese all-you-can-eat sushi buffet and not touching the sushi. I mean, that's really, the Sierras are pretty spectacular, and you all should go. It's, you know, for someone like me who doesn't like artificial work, the idea of hiking, like, hell no. Um, I have a chance to do real stuff, but it's pretty breathtaking. That said, uh, Dave Brower, um, in addition to paying, for, are you, what scholarship was it, the Brower Fund Awards, or what? Cool. Anyway, yeah, Dave, Dave was pretty spectacular, and y'all should just look up on YouTube some of his old talks. Um, I was his scheduling assistant, which was an amazing job, um, and he told me to be audacious and bold to the degree that uh, my first job working at William Morris, I told my then boss, y'all know who Jane's Addiction is, right? Yes? No? Yeah, it's old school rock, but it's still pretty good. Um, I told my boss, who was the rock star with a large checkbook, I said, Perry, if the rainforests are all gone, all the good drugs will be gone too. <laughs> and the head of the Rainforest Action Network, you've heard about RAN, you know what RAN is, right? They're pretty active. Um, the head of RAN came in and got a half million dollar check because Perry really wanted the good drugs to be around, um, if that's what it takes. Um, you, who did that? Oh my God, it's a, that's right. Well, you know that part about the talk where I said you can kill things and mess up while you're in college, it doesn't cost much, right? Um, yeah, exactly. So I think by that reaction, gardening's kind of important. Um, so we're gonna do the, t hands up, people that wanna do the Twitter feed, give flowers away on campus to random strangers and make them in, in exuberantly happy. Let's see. Okay, all right, so you know, don't, don't make, one dahlia per arrangement, guys. We have to make these last. We actually have uh, buy-in. Um, and then the last part, can you move this board up? Because I just want to get some input from everybody. All right. So um, one of the hard lessons that I learned when I was in college as a student activist, I was on the first national board of a group called the Student Environmental Action Coalition, um, is I was in Cleveland in the wintertime protesting the evils of British petroleum. Ooh, bad, right? Cleveland, wintertime. Um, my friends who had cozied up to the Tides Foundation and the United Nations Environmental Program staffers were in Rio de Janeiro and Switzerland. So I learned the hard way, if you have funds, you can do whatever kind of program work you want to do. And environmentalism, at least 20 years ago, was generally counter to what corporate interests are. Now, thank God, greenwashing is happening because a lot of you guys are going to be able to get jobs working for British Petroleum as environmentalists, as strange as that sounds. Um, Why well, you guys aren't bad? I know. Are you pretty bad? Really? <laughs> come here, here, wait, wait. Come, come. Show me, give me come, some come, instruction. Come here. I'm giving you instruction. Just shut up. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. Anyone want these? There she is. There you go. <laughs> Tell him he sucks. There you go, see, you're doing all right. Okay, so, pretty bad. It's context, right? Um, I mean, if, if she was 70 years old and she had a mustache, she would be just as happy, but you're not and you, you still are. He's like, oh no, you didn't. Yes, I did. Okay. Um, so, finding funding for what you need to do is absolutely absolutely essential and it enables all sorts of good works to be done. Um, my own program was cut 100% in the crisis 
of the budget created by both my superintendent and the governor. It was a political decision. So I lost $307,000 July 1st. I was told to raise $100,000 by the end of my contract, which was September 4th, and $100,000 would be restored. I happened to take the role of both City Hall and the school district's florist. So there isn't an office that I can't walk into because you know we just gave the girl who doesn't have a mustache flowers and she's completely delighted, right? Good. That's a horrible thing to say. I'm so sorry. Bad name. Um, but I did call the city council president a flower whore, so it's all context. Um, I raised over a half million dollars, quarter million dollar from a donor that I met via Twitter, which is cool. Um, one of the things about social media, which I'm really into, who does Twitter? All the people with their ha hands in the air. If you, who has 100 followers on Twitter? Who's got 1,000 followers on Twitter? Who's got 5,000 followers on Twitter? Okay, that would be me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, would be a, it would be, you know, I use Twitter as telling a story. It's one of the things I learned from the David Brower guy that you're going to look up on YouTube because David Brower, again, thought if people experienced what we wanted to save, they would actually act to save it. And last time I checked, there is not a Disneyland resort in Yosemite. Anyone seen that one? No. Okay. Or a dam in the Grand Canyon, something else he did. Um, funding is absolutely essential. Um, I'm assuming you guys are pretty smart because you're at UCLA and not USC. So I'm going to see how many of you, besides our performance art project, where you're going to go give flowers to people to make them happy. Um, how many of you guys want to help me do a little policy work for the second largest school district in the country? Hands? Great. Okay. All right. So we'll talk afterwards. Because um, I start my new job as the director of policy for an entity that has a $7 billion budget. They've got a construction program that right now is up to $20.5 billion, the largest public works project in the history of the United States. Any of you from Boston? Right? No? Good. Uh, they suck. Um, <laughs> I like Tufts. Um, so how do you do green policy for a school district that, that's that big? What would you think would be the first thing that I have to go tackle? What's that? Opposition. Opposition. OK, well, OK. What would be, let me rephrase that. What would be an issue that you would think that the second largest school district in the country, the largest one on the West Coast, should be doing for its kids? Teaching them. Teaching them. OK, so environmental education. That's kind of important. right? because the district has no environmental education curriculum. How many of you guys had environmental ed in high school? Cool. How many? Hands up. Let's see. So you ended up in this class anyway. Or you ended up in this class because you kind of got an excitement sort of thing about it. And of the folks who had environmental edu education in high school, how many of you actually want to go into an environmental career? Right. OK. What kind of career do you want to do? Law. Law. Right. Sue the man. Cool. I assume that's what that means, right? No, yes, kinda. What? What? What then? Which means? Sue the man. <laughs> NRDC, which sues the man. Gotcha. Okay. What? What else? What other environmental careers? Uh, environmental engineering. Environmental engineering. Okay. What does that mean? And windmills and stuff. <laughs> I'm going to write that. OK. I think USC could do better, but we'll see. Windmills and stuff. OK. That, this is all code for green jobs, right? OK. Um, and what other kinds of, what kind of issues that the second largest school district in the country should be taking on? Energy. Now, one of the things they have taken a leadership role on uh, <coughs> is solar. Um, they recently took off the shelf, but they at least put it out there, a $500 million solar power initiative. For every prison looking building in LA Unified is a rooftop, mostly flat, where you can drop solar panels. Unfortunately, the extent of their environmental sustainability piece of the most recent school bond, which was $7 billion, I said billion, uh, excluded all other forms of the environment. So the natural world, hello, this, uh, was completely excluded. Something tells me if I brought solar panels here, which I always make the argument this Chardonnay leaf is a solar panel, but if I brought solar panels, I don't think the girls would be down here having quite as good time. How are you doing, by the way? 
Is this rocking? Yeah? Cool. Is this like the coolest class you've ever had at U UCLA? Yeah. Really? Wow. And Spencer, did you find out how much it cost for this whole class to meet here? Did you break it down, the math? Uh, no, I didn't crunch the numbers. I can do that later. Okay, crunch the numbers, Spencer, and we'll get back to that. Um, okay, so I don't even know what I, oh, it, yeah, environmental jobs, uh, solar. All right, so there's three things, the education piece, uh, windmills and stuff, okay, energy, which is the heart of that is green jobs and solar. I could go through this all day and we could all talk about different things that are going on. The thing, because it's food, the big thing that I'm going to have fun with is currently if a school serves food from the garden, which is local, grown by kids, it's not like a cow from Chino where, you know, the cow crapped and then the crap ended up in the burger and then it was a really crappy burger, literally. <laughs> And then E. coli, which any of you guys have had food poisoning. Um, it's much like watching the third season of American Idol, but worse. Um, pretty nasty issue. Um, tomatoes also, salmonella, all these diseases. Um, you cannot serve the food from a garden in the cafeteria. It's illegal. You also can't have fruit trees on campuses. They're illegal. You can't do the things that pretty much Michelle Obama's doing. So that makes an opportunity for us. They're the food service industry, how's the food at UCLA? Good. It's good? Great. Well, yeah, yeah. Come, come to where I work and then experience the other side of industrial food service. Um, you guys have the option of coming here. Uh, food service is something they use to lure you in to encourage your student loan debt. Um, really, um, the PETAs are pretty good off campus too. You have that option. But kids at LA Unified don't have a choice. The average USDA subsidy for school lunches is $2.53. The school district spends 57 cents on the food itself. So that, that sheriff uh, in Arizona that feeds people green bologna, I think he's actually dropping more than our school district is. So one of the, the cheeky things that we're going to do is suggest from my school board member's office that the school district buy 10% local organic and see what happens. Hooray, exactly. Tara understands what that means. Um, because there's thousands and thousands of acres of organic production in California, the growers have agreed to meet the prices needed for the uh, customer service uh, 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 fees. And it would be kind of subversive. And it's going to be really interesting to see just who's going to oppose local organic apples in the cafeteria. And love, yes. 90. 90. 90. And only 11 of those are certified organic. Right. And I'm, by the way, certified too. This, the, the school, there's two certified uh, school gardens, Venice High School, North Hollywood. Um, we have Dahlia Smackdown, and it's quite, uh, quite an uneven match, not like on UCLA football. So anyway, <laughs> I think my, my internal clock is working. The most important thing that is learned in gardening is what now? Yeah, that's, that's kind of useful, but you know, I abuse plants quite a bit, and I don't know if, if my plant butchery would be considered empathy, although I intuitively know them. I mean, I know the plants, I'm, I'm the Dahlia Whisperer, whatever. Um, but one of the most important lessons, and something that this <coughs> world has gotten itself out of balance because of, and one of the most important lessons that I teach my students, my four-year-olds in East LA, and my Mohawk-wearing 17-year-olds in North Hollywood alike, is this little value called patience and having a certain reverence for the plant world is all the more easier when you have patience. Um, that said, those of you who want to help me out with school district policy, that's not a patient world, and fundraising certainly is cutthroat. Uh, I've got an event coming up in a couple weeks with Maroon 5. The Environmental Media Association has adopted my programs, and I've, if I had more time, I would tell you about marketing and why that should be something that those of you who are interested in environmental studies need to know, because Business is all about innovation and marketing, and if you don't have that down, even as a nonprofit business person, you will be broke in Cleveland with British Petroleum in the winter. And I thank you for your time. Cool. Is this fun?